The Vast Wonder of the World, Biologist Ernest Everett Just, written by Melina Mangal, illustrated by Louisa Uribe. The Vast Wonder of the World. Woods Hole, Massachusetts, 1911. At twilight, a man lay on a dock, luring marine worms with a lantern. He scooped them out with his net and placed them in a bucket. He couldn't wait to look at them more closely. He knew the ways of the sea, though he was not a fisherman. His grandfather had built wharves, but he was not a dock worker. His name was Ernest Everett Just, and he was a scientist. Ernest was not like other scientists. He saw the whole where others saw only parts. He noticed details others failed to see. On the dock at dawn, he wrote poetry. Back in his laboratory, Ernest examined the marine worms under the microscope. He recorded and sketched their movements. How did their tiny egg cells create new life, he wondered. At a time when few expected a black man to do so well, Ernest became the world authority on how life begins from an egg. From early on, Ernest wondered about the world of water around him. Born in Charleston, South Carolina, where rivers and ocean meet, Ernest watched how fishermen netted their catch. He learned how to read from his mother's schoolteacher mother. After his father died when he was four, he learned how hard life could be. To find better paying work, Ernest's mother moved their family from the city across the river to the country. Soon after, Ernest caught typhoid fever. He survived, but he had lost his ability to read. He cried alone, struggling to relearn it all. Then one day, a miracle, Ernest could read again. He read as often as he could, letting his imagination roam. Words came to life as magical spirits. Ernest attended the school his mother created and the town she also established. Ernest's mother never stopped working. Ernest never stopped observing, even while cooking, cleaning, and watching his younger brother and sister. He observed how a hurricane damaged their school, how tougher segregation laws restricted African Americans, and how his mother's remarriage changed life at home. What Ernest really loved to observe, though, was nature. Surrounded by rivers and ocean, marsh and mud, he found plenty to explore. At 13, Ernest left home to attend boarding school in Orangeburg, South Carolina. It was here he published his first poem. When he graduated, Ernest returned home, hoping to begin teaching in his mother's school, but a fire had destroyed it. Ernest left the segregated South on a steamship to continue his education up north. He dove into his new classes at a college preparatory school in New Hampshire. While he was away, his mother fell ill with tuberculosis and died. Ernest was stunned. Full of grief and confusion, Ernest did the only thing he knew to do, return to his studies. He thought of his family and how they depended on him. He thought of his mother's hard work and belief in education. He had to keep going. He went on to Dartmouth College, working to pay his own way and to support his brother and sister back home. With less time to study, Ernest failed the class. Ernest took a biology class and his life changed forever. In that class, he discovered the microscopic world of the cell. Scientists knew that the cell is the smallest building block of life, but many had only a basic understanding of how the different parts of the cell work together as new life developed. Ernest wanted to unlock this mystery. And he did. Ernest became a biology professor at Howard University in Washington, DC, teaching students to question and observe. Each summer, he traveled to the Marine Biological Laboratory in Woods Hole, Massachusetts to research and experiment. Out on the collecting boat, Ernest looked for sea urchins, sand dollars, starfish, and marine worms. He then carefully transported them to the lab in a covered bucket so the beating sun would not damage them. Most scientists carelessly remove sea animals to study, but Ernest demonstrated that by observing living things in as natural an environment as possible, they could learn more. Ernest also taught scientists how to thoroughly cleanse glassware and equipment for the most accurate experiments.
Using a simple light microscope, Ernest examined the egg cells of all those sea animals, night after night, day after day. While observing sand dollar eggs, Ernest noticed a wave of movement when a sperm contacted the egg. A slight of the shiver, it signaled an amazing discovery. The egg cell directed its own development during fertilization. This controversial idea went against what most scientists thought at the time. It wasn't just the sperm creating changes. The cell surface and the layer right below it were just as important in generating new life. Ernest published his research finding in many scientific papers. He traveled to conferences to share his ideas and he won the first double NACP Spingarn Medal. As his reputation grew, Ernest's ideas caught the attention of scientists around the world. He was the first American research scientist invited to the world famous Kaiser Wilhelm Institute in Berlin, Germany. From then on, Ernest worked in Europe as often and as long as he could, enjoying more warmth and respect than he'd ever felt in America. Despite his accomplishments, Ernest felt increasingly stifled in the United States. His family was not welcome with him in Massachusetts because of the color of their skin. He struggled for basic laboratory equipment at Howard. He didn't have the freedom white scientists had to choose where they worked. This time came when Ernest refused to toler tolerate the segregation any longer. He decided to move to France and become an independent researcher. Crossing the Atlantic, Ernest thought about the hundreds of students he'd introduced to science and how his fascination with cells began. He poured those memories and feelings in his work and completed a groundbreaking book. Through his careful observations and hard work, Ernest opened up the wonder of the universe to all of us through a tiny egg cell.